right, wasn't that a great service on Sunday night? Missionary with uh, Brother Wyrick being here and explaining his ministry. Uh, he was here seven years ago when we first met him, but even this time we learned more about what he's doing. He is, he's got his feet on the ground and he's working hard and doing a lot of different things. And that was a blessing and encouragement. And then Brother Smith being with us, uh, unplanned, uh, although uh, it wasn't unplanned to God. Apparently he, he knew we needed to have Brother Smith here Sunday night. He and his wife and their little daughter and the testimony he gave about their, their call to uh, China. And so it was a mini missions conference on Sunday evening, and that was really a blessing. Uh, we had to turn the lights on some of you because you didn't want to go home Sunday night. So that's always a good thing. All right, Nehemiah chapter 4 tonight. The book of Nehemiah and chapter 4. We have been going through this book, and just again quickly to remind you, Nehemiah chapter 1 was Nehemiah's concern. When his brother Hananiah, Hananiah came to visit him, he wanted to know how the walls of Jerusalem were doing. He had a concern for it. Chapter 2 was Nehemiah's faith. As he went before the king and made his prayer and asked the king for his leave, that he could go back to Jerusalem and begin the building of those walls. Chapter 3, we looked at the workers and got a lot of, a lot of information out of chapter 3. The names of the people, their, their work ethic as they stood shoulder to shoulder and rebuilding the walls and the gates and the towers of that city. Those that worked, those that finished their job and went on and did other work after that, those that would not work, the Tekoites, their nobles put not their necks to the work. So we learned a lot of it in chapter 3. Then last week we started in chapter 4 and did not get finished, which is not unusual with this preacher. Well, we started chapter 4, and we're looking at the four forms of opposition as the devil, through human instrumentality, tried to stop the work of Nehemiah on the wall. Now, there's always a spiritual reason behind everything physical that we see. And that's al it's always good to keep that in mind, uh, even as we think about the current situation over in Ukraine. All the news stations and talking heads and all that will give you all the political reasons and economic reasons and national reasons. Uh, Putin does not recognize Ukraine as being a separate country, but that it's always been Russian people, and he says that they, they, have, they claim a legal right to it nationally. And people will talk about all those different things, all that information. But nobody, absolute nobody, is looking at the spiritual side. They're not looking at what's going on in Ukraine and why, why the devil wants to shut down Ukraine. And we've talked about it here, that those that we know that are over there have said that, that most of the missionaries in Russia are Ukrainians. And that Ukraine has been the gospel hub for that part of Eastern Europe for quite some time. That's why the devil's doing all this. That's why he's using Russia as a puppet to go in there and do what they're doing. And again, we can, we can have sanctions... And we can do all kinds of human maneuvering. But always remember, there's a, spiritual, uh, there's a spiritual thing behind it. Here we find Tobiah and Gershom. We find Sanballat. These are the human instrumentality. <laughs> if we can liken it, they're the Russians, all right? Nehemiah is the Ukrainians. And I don't mean that literally, uh, but just as illustration. That's what's going on. And the devil is using those men to try to stop the work of God. And so it's a spiritual reason that's before it. Now last week we began in the, verse set, the first uh, nine verses, I believe it was, and we looked at the first two reasons, and that was, the first one was mockery or ridicule. Uh, Sanballat and the others, it says in verse number one, they mocked the Jews. They used words. Again, we've made reference to sticks and stones may break your bones, but words can never hurt you. Well, words can hurt you, but they can't harm you. And we need to be strong enough in our faith that we're not afraid of what people say. And yet the devil knows that that's a very strong weapon. We're afraid of what people are going to say about us. That's why we often don't pass out a gospel tract. 
Don't approach a stranger in Walmart or somewhere and invite them to church. Don't take flyers for the revival meeting and give them to neighbors. We're worried about what they'll say. They'll think we're holy rollers. They'll think we're religious fanatics. We worry, we do worry about what people say. And God help us to get the victory over that. Because what we, resent, what we represent in the Lord Jesus Christ is far greater than anything this world has to offer. And to be ashamed of him is not a good thing. And, and basically our silence, that's what it is when we're not willing to speak out for him. So ridicule, they mocked the Jews, they made fun of them, they teased them about what they were doing for the Lord. Then the second thing we saw was intimidation. That was down in verse number 7. As they took as, the, as uh, Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites, all these, all these individuals and groups surrounded the city of Jerusalem, that two and a half mile circumference. They surrounded it and just sat there on their horses or sat there in uh, armed for warfare and just their presence was there to intimidate the Jews to get them to stop doing what they're doing. Mockery. Intimidation. I like though what it says in verse number 9, Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. They didn't allow the mockery and the intimidation to stop what they were doing. What a great example for us. What a great challenge for us. Don't let what others say, well, did you hear what so-and-so said? Don't worry about it. Well, I wonder what some people think about the church. Don't worry about it. I never have. I've never worried what people think. We know, we know what's going on here. We know what we are here. And, and a lost world is going to mock what they don't understand, so don't worry about all that. Tonight we're going to look at the last two, the second two steps, and then again how Jeremiah responded to those. We're going to begin in verse number 10 this evening, and just read down, well, we'll read down to, well, we could read to the whole chapter, but we'll read down to somewhere down there. I'll stop when I feel like stopping. How's that? We'll start in verse number 10. We're going to look at the remainder of the chapter, but uh, we'll, we'll see where we go from here. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse number 10. After all this, after the mockery, after the intimidation, and they weren't going to be dissuaded, they're going to continue working, verse 10 says this. And Judah said, now this is not Sanballat and Tobiah and Gershom. This is not the Arabians and the Ammonites. This is Judah. Part of them. And Judah said, the strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed and there is much rubbish so that we are not able to build the wall. Verse 10 is going to be our third step we'll look at and then verse 11. And our adversaries said, see there's the inside and outside. Judah, those among themselves, then the adversaries, that's those outside, the adversary said, they shall not know neither see till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us, notice this, ten times, from all the places whence ye shall return unto us, they will be upon you. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Father, we thank you for this historical account in the book of Nehemiah and the reality of it. Lord, what Nehemiah faced and the people that were building the wall, the opposition that went against them. And Father, we thank you for the application, the truth that we see fulfilled even in our day today. That Lord, so many are against the work of God. Whether on the mission field or whether here at home. Lord, help us not to be surprised and amazed when opposition shows its face. And help us to recognize, Father, when we see that opposition, that, that the human instrumentality is, is what we see, and that's all it is, human instrumentality, and there is an evil spirit behind it. There is the power of Satan working behind the scenes. And Lord, help us to stand strong. Help us to stand firm. Help us to take Nehemiah's example of praying and watching and working. Bless our study of this chapter tonight. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Mockery, intimidation. Verse number 10, discouragement. Discouragement. The mockery came from the outside, Sanballat, Tobiah. 
the intimidation came from the outside, the Ammonites, the, the Arabians, the Ashdodites. But this thing of, of discouragement came from inside. Notice it says in verse 10, and Judah said, you know who Judah is? Judah is part of them. Part of this work group, part of this work crew. And that's what the devil does. He begins from the outside and attacks from the outside. And we've talked about this in, in going through the word of God and the different books of the Bible we've taught over the past years. We've seen this over and over and over again. The devil's tactics have not changed. They'll start by he'll start by attacking from the outside and then he'll switch to attacking from the inside. If that doesn't work, he'll go back to the outside. He just flip-flops, goes back and forth. There is no other tactic. It's inside, outside. We've talked about this before. The devil is described by two proper nouns or proper names, and that is the devil and Satan. And they're almost used interchangeably. In fact, the word devil appears 61 times in the Bible. The devil, identified by devil. Not the devils, the, his imps, his demons as they call them. Not the devil. But the devil himself is mentioned 61 times. Satan is mentioned 56 times. All right, almost an even balance. What's the difference between the two? Are they just an intermingling? Are they just mixed? Is there a difference? Oh, yes, there's a great difference. The devil himself as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The devil, when, when he's attacking from the outside, he's identified in the Bible as the devil. That's his outward manifestation and his attack against the church. And so those 61 times he's mentioned that way, it's talking about him from the outside wanting to attack the church. When he is called Satan, it's when he is within the church. You remember Paul, uh, John writing to one of the churches, I know where Satan's seat, in, seat is, that dwelleth among you. When you find the word Satan in the Bible, it's describing his attack against the church itself from the inside. 61 times. I, I'm always amazed at the Bible, and I never saw this before. I should charge you money before I tell you this. 61 times the devil, 56 times Satan. Add those two together, that's 117. The minute I saw that, I thought, no, that can't be. Because I knew there's another word or words that are 117 times, and that's the word church or church is. Those two words are mentioned 117 times in the Bible, and the devil and Satan are mentioned 117 times in the Bible. Folks, that's not a coincidence. That's God's divine pen on the pages of this paper, knowing, telling the church that their number one enemy is the devil or Satan, and he'll attack from outside, and he'll attack from inside, but when you get attacked, it's not, and please don't misjudge me, it's not the village council, and they haven't attacked us, don't worry. It's not even the neighbors that throw the beer cans on the yard, and that hasn't happened for a long time. It's not the guy that goes to the back door and rips the signs off because he's mad at us for one thing or another, and that's been a few years ago. But that's, that's the human instrumentality. There's a power that's behind that, and that's the devil, and that's Satan. And here in chapter 4 and verse 10, the devil has attacked through mockery and intimidation from the outside. It's not been successful, so he finds someone on the inside that he can use. You know, the devil's done that in churches for centuries. Found someone on the inside that he could use. You would think, I'd like, you'd like to think that surely the devil could not find somebody in the church to discourage people. No one in the church to be negative Ned, or like, there's no Neds here, so I'm safe. Or negative Ness, all right? Surely the devil couldn't find, but he's able to do it. He's able to find, and here he found some from Judah, some from that very group that were there. And it says, they said this, the strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed. There is much rubbish, so that we are not able... Notice those words, we are not able. There should never be words that we have to repeat like that. We are not, when God gives a task to be done, there should never be a we are not able. It will wear you out. 
It will tire you out. Serving God will do that. I'm reminded of the famous words of the evangelist George Whitfield who said, I'm never tired, I'm never weary of the work, but I'm often weary in the work. We don't mind working and serving God, but it can be exhausting. It can be tiring sometimes. And here these, I understand, they are collecting the materials of the wall that's been torn down. They are getting fresh hewn tumber, uh, timber uh, from... Well, I got Tirzah, the keeper of the forest, back there, wherever he was in chapter 2. They're, they're doing all, this is, this is hard work. And they're rebuilding these walls and rebuilding these, these gates and all this stuff. I understand that. But in the midst of their exhaustion, this is what happened. The devil comes and taps them on the shoulder and said, why are you wasting your time? Why are you doing this? This is never going to produce fruit. This is never going to come, come to anything uh, good. Uh, you remember what they said back in verse number 2? Uh, what do these feeble Jews? You know what's happening in verse number 10? The men of Judah are listening to what Sanballat and Tobiah said. And they haven't let, let it go and got victory over it. And they're letting it affect them. They said they were feeble Jews. Are these feeble Jews? No, they're not. But now they're feeling that way. Because somebody called them feeble. He says, hey, we don't have strength to finish it. We can't bear the burdens anymore. We can't carry these loads. Now, I'm getting ahead of the story. They're going to. They're going to finish it. They're, go they're going to overcome this discouragement. But the issue for us to you and I see is, is in the midst of the work, discouragement can rise its head. And it does here from the inside. The strength of the bearers of the burdens is decayed. So there is much rubbish. You know, it was one thing. Look back at verse number 2, the end of verse 2. Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? It's one thing for Tobiah to call the walls of Jerusalem that have been burned down rubbish. It's another thing for the men of Judah, the men of Israel, to call the walls of Jerusalem rubbish. That's almost blasphemous. That city of Jerusalem, those walls that had been built, that were the glory of the whole earth, and yet the Jews, these men of Judah, in their discouragement, are calling them rubbish, just like the enemies of God did in verse number 2. That's how discouraged they've gotten, exhausted, tired, worn out, not thinking right, not thinking straight, saying things they probably would not have said, if they weren't so discouraged. Now I know I'm preaching to a bunch of people that have never experienced discouragement, so this is all like new to you. And you say, wow, I didn't know it worked like that. When you get emotionally tired and physically worn out, that's when discouragement comes in. When the devil plants negative thoughts, even about the church and about the work of God and things of God, yeah, that's how it works. The devil often will say, well, you don't need to witness it. You've witnessed before, it didn't do any good. You've asked people to church, they don't come. <laughs> Preachers, you've preached on that before, nobody changed anything. It's easy to get discouraged. And we've got to be careful when it does because we've got to recognize the source and the power behind it. Here it is showing its head in, in chapter 4 and verse number 10. We are not able. They were discouraged. Don't be, can I, can, I encourage, can I encourage you? Don't be the discourager. Look back at uh, the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers, chapter 13. No, Numbers chapter 32. Numbers chapter 32. The children of Israel back in Numbers 13 went to spy out the land of Canaan. You remember the story? And we're not looking at Numbers 13, we're in Numbers 32. This is when they get ready to go into the land. And Numbers 13 is when they spied it out. Twelve men went to spy the land, didn't they not? Ten of them said, we can't go in. There's giants in there. We can't take it. Now, God had told him, that's the land flowing with milk and honey I've got for you. But they didn't believe it. And so they said, we, we are not able. 
That's the same thing. We are not able to go and take that land. Only two men out of the 12 said, we can do this. That was Joshua and Caleb. You remember the story. Well, in chapter 32 of Numbers, they're ready to go in. Look at verse number 6. And Moses said unto the children of Gad, to the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war, and shall you sit here? Verse 7. And wherefore discourage ye the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord hath given them? Thus did your fathers when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. That's Numbers chapter 13. When the spies went and saw it, they said, we can't go in. Now they're getting ready to go in, and two of the tribes, Gad and Reuben, decide they're not going to fight also. And, and Moses says, you are discouraging the heart of the children of people. Verse 9. For when they went out up into the valley of Eskol and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the children of Israel that they should not go into the land which the Lord had given them. The Lord had given it to them. And they knew that, and the Lord told them that, and yet they said, we can't go. And discouraged the hearts of others. Don't be the discourager. Don't let, don't let the devil use you to discourage the work of God. Here the walls are being built. Things are going forward. And yet the devil is able to use the men of Judah to discourage the hearts of the people. Look at Deuteronomy. If you're back there in Numbers 32, turn a few pages to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Verse number 28. Look at verse 27. Moses says, And you murmured in your tents and said, Because the Lord hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt. Is that accurate? Because the Lord hated us, he brought us out of the land of Egypt. But they say in verse number 27, He hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites and to destroy us. Verse 28. Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our heart, saying, The people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakims there. Our brethren have discouraged our heart. When the devil cannot be successful from the outside, he will try to attack from the inside. When mockery doesn't work, when intimidation doesn't work, well, he'll try whatever he can try. He'll use discouragement. There are two sources for, of discouragement mentioned here. Why did some of the people from Judah discourage the others for finishing the walls? This has been suggested. Look at Nehemiah chapter 6. There's something very unusual going on here. You know that Tobiah is the enemy of the walls of Jerusalem. He's the enemy of the Jews. Tobiah. Well, notice what the Bible tells us in Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse number 17. Nehemiah 6, 17. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah, all right, you got who this is? The ones that have discouraged the hearts of the people? The nobles of Judah sent many letters unto Tobiah, and letters of Tobiah came unto them. Judah had a a secret relationship with Tobiah, the enemy. You know, when we begin to compromise with sin, that will discourage us. You know when people doubt their salvation? When their life isn't right. Here, they're, they're having correspondence with Tobiah. Why are, they, why are they corresponding with Tobiah? Well, look at verse 18. For there were many in Judah sworn unto him, because he, Tobiah, was son-in-law of Shechaniah and of Era, the son of Era. And his son Johanan had taken the daughter of Meshullam, the son of Berechiah. You know why one of the reasons Judah cooled off in their work for God and murmured and complained and discouraged the hearts? Because Tobiah was one of them. He had married into their family. He was a relative. Can I shoot off a warning flare right now? Be careful lest the devil tempt you to compromise your stand for the gospel and for Christ for family's sake. 
Now, I'm not saying be anti-family, you understand. I'm not saying cast your family aside. But sin is sin, whether strangers do it or family members do it. And we are all, we are all tempted and more prone to defend the family members that do wrong than we are the outsiders that do wrong. And when we do that, we put ourselves in the same position that the nobles of Judah were in. Here they are building the wall. Tobiah's against it. One of their men's daughters is married to Tobiah. She's the daughter-in-law. And one of their sons is married to one of the other Jews. There's a connection going here that has compromised the whole situation. They, are, they, are, they have been weakened in their resolve because of family problems and family matters. When the family suffers from sin, when kids go awry and do bad, oh, we love them, we pray for them, that's fine. Don't defend their wrongdoing. You ever been to a Little League game? Little League baseball game? You ever been to the game? Watching the kids is so much fun. You ever watch the parents? It ain't fun. And their kids are the next Mickey Mantle, and they just know it. They're, they're, Lou Gehrig's right there on the diamond, and nobody else recognizes it but them. How dare that umpire call that one on the outside corner, call it a strike on their little Jimmy or Jeff or whatever. Sorry, Jeff. On their little Jimmy or whoever it is. When, it, when, it's, when it's relative, it's different. We handle it differently. We've got to be careful. These men of Judah, the reason they compromised their, their strong stand was because of family matters. Look over at chapter 13. The Bible is an amazing book. You know that? <laughs> and so, so accurate. And it's got our human nature down to a T. That's why, that's why people don't like the Bible. Because it sees right through them. It... it uh, Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing even to the, uh, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Here are these men of Judah, they're saying, you know, we're just, we're, we're, we're just tired and we're weak. No, that's not it. You've compromised. You've intermingled with Tobiah and, and, and this group out here, and therefore you're not as strong as you ought to be. Look in Nehemiah chapter 13, verse number 15. In those days saw I in, where? Judah. In those days I saw in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath. That is forbidden by the law of Moses, by the way. And bringing in sheaves and lading asses as also wine, grapes, and figs, and all manner of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. You know what the men of Judah were doing? They were making money on the Sabbath day. They were making a hustle. They were bringing in a day where the law forbid them to do that, and they were, they were doing their working the threshing floor and bringing in stuff from the wine presses and setting up a market and selling it and doing all stuff. And now that Nehemiah is setting up the walls, that's going to endanger their business. That's going to hurt them financially. You know, a lot of people will compromise over money. Sacrifice their standards over the almighty dollar. That's the Judah's, that was Judah's problem. Why did they do what they did back here in verse number 9? Well, or verse 10, yeah, they were tired. Yeah, they were worn out. Yeah, it was hard work. But there were underlying factors. They had family matters they hadn't disclosed. They had financial matters that were motivating them. I have learned in many, many years of ministry that things are never what they appear to be. We've had folks that have left the church. People have moved on. That's fine. But there's some folks that have just decided for one reason or another, they're, they're done. They're leaving. And on many occasions, I've tried to sit down or, or call and talk and say, what's wrong? What's going on? Can I tell you this? I have never gotten a straight answer. They have never told me why they're actually... They've come up with this thing and that thing, and, and it's like, 
Those things don't make sense. You know what they are? They're being like Judah in verse 10. They're given, they're given some reasons. Oh, well, we're tired and we're worn out and it's just all rubbish here. No, that's not the reason. There was something behind it that was motivating their actions and their behavior. And, in the, and, the, and the crux of the whole thing was they were discouraging the hearts of other people. Don't be a discourager. Don't let those things overcome you. Don't let the devil have that victory. So we've got mockery. We've got intimidation. We've got discouragement. And all this leads to number four, the strongest of the four different oppositions, and that's fear. Beginning in verse number 13, Nehemiah says, Therefore set I in the lower places behind the wall, and on the higher places I even set the people after their families with their swords and spears and their bows. And I looked and rose up and said to the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. See, there's the problem. All this has happened to put fear in the hearts of these quote-unquote feeble Jews and get them to stop building the wall. Oh, if you just stop building, we can get along. Just don't be so dogmatic. Why do you have to build this wall? It's been gone for centuries or for decades now. What's the big deal? Build your houses, live around here, but just forget about those walls. Don't, don't, don't worry about that. We can live in peace and harmony if you just back down a little bit. Same thing the enemies of the church say today. Don't be so dogmatic. Is that all you can ever talk about? Just back down a little bit. Be not afraid of them, Nehemiah says. Remember the Lord. See, what's going on here with all these, with this mockery and intimidation, with this, with this uh, uh, discouragement and this fear, is all geared toward getting their eyes off God. And society and the world today wants, us, wants our eyes off God. CNN, MSNBC, Newsmax, and some of those are better than others, but they're all putting our eyes on something other than God. Not a one of them is directing us toward God. Now, I'm not saying stick your head in the, in the sand and don't pay attention to what's going on. Get some news, some, a little bit, a very, very little bit. Get it. You, you, you want to know what's going on. But you understand the news doesn't tell you what's going on. They are very selective in their reporting. If you haven't got, most of you are old enough, if you haven't got that, it doesn't matter if I'm going to tell you or not anyways. If you haven't figured that out by now. There's a trucker convoy going through Cambridge tomorrow, right? Meeting at Shenandoah Inn in the afternoon. This freedom trucker convoy going through. Try to find that on your news channel. I don't care which one you watch. You try to find it. I heard about it through Dustin and Katie. I didn't know about it, so I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find out about this. So I, I Googled it and looked it up. And I found some obscure news sources, these, you know, these... Uh, Minor company. There's nothing on there from any of the big guys. None of the main, none of the TV channels have anything on the internet about that. It's all small, independent na uh, uh, networks that are that are, are along the route, pretty much, is what it is. But nobody else is covering that. They don't want you to know about it. They don't want you to know about th that kind of stuff. It's not being reported. Don't get your news from there. How did we get here? I'm talking about where I'm talking about in my sermon right now. How did we get to this? Anyways, fear. They're going to use fear to try to get them to stop. You know what fear does? The, the popular phrase, fear, fear paralyzes. Fear para you ever seen the deer standing in the middle of the road? You come up and its eyes just get big as saucers and it's, it doesn't know what to do. It's just standing still. It's paralyzed with fear. People, you read about that happening sometimes in a house fire. Somebody's caught in there and the, the fear of what's happening, they, you know what to do, you run. You see a bear in the woods, you know what to do, you run. But sometimes people just, they get, they get paralyzed with fear. The devil counts on that. 
He's walking about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. I don't know this for fact, but I've heard this said, that a lion doesn't roar till it's ready to pounce on its prey. That while it's stalking, and I've seen that in the Nature Channel, things like that, while it's stalking, it's doing it silently, it doesn't roar until it's too late for the, for the victim and it's ready to pounce. And here's, here's the fear of the devil being put into these folks, and they're afraid, and Nehemiah has to tell them, don't be afraid, don't be paralyzed. Fear and faith cannot exist in the same heart. Look at uh, Mark chapter 8, turn, turn there, keep your place in Nehemiah, but look at Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Nope, oh, that's Matthew. I've got to learn how to read my own writing one of these days. Matthew chapter 8. I was looking at Mark 8, 26, and I thought, uh-oh, I'm in trouble now. Matthew 8. This is the great tempest on the sea. Preached on that about a month or so ago. The great tempest in verse 24, the great calm in verse 26. But in verse 26, in the midst of this storm, Jesus says to them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? The answer is right there in the question. Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? The greater our faith, the less our fear. Nehemiah had to say to them, Be not afraid. The enemy is attacking. The, me, the enemy is trying to get them paralyzed with fear. You and I are called to be good soldiers for Jesus Christ. If we're going to be good soldiers, we can't live in fear. You can't have your... The, they call it the, the fog of war. Your head can't be in a fog when you're in a war, even a spiritual one. You've got, you've got to be ready to be a good soldier. How do we do that? Well, I'm glad Nehemiah shows us. Notice three things here that Nehemiah does. First of all, you want to be a good soldier? You want to fight? Here's the, the mockery, the intimidation. Here's the discouragement. Here's the fear. Now notice what Nehemiah does about that. Therefore, in verse 13, I sat in the lower places behind the wall and on the higher places... I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. Be prepared. Be prepared. The Boy Scout motto. Know that mockery might come. Intimidation will come. Discouragement's going to come. Fear is going to come. Know those things and be prepared. Nehemiah came up with a plan. He said in verse 14, I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles, to the rulers, to the rest of the people, be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. And it came to pass, when our enemies heard that it was known unto us, and God had brought their counsel to naught, then we returned all of us to the wall, every one to his work. See how easy it was to overcome the fear? Be prepared. Nehemiah tells them, don't be afraid. Get together with your families, your brethren, your daughters, your wives, your houses. Let's continue the work. The word of encouragement, preparation. Being ready, expecting it. I like the story I heard out of the Ukraine. I don't know if it's true or not because I heard it on the news. But I heard something on there, and I think it was on the radio. I heard that uh, the other day when the invasion was starting, that the government of Ukraine was driving through the towns handing out rifles and guns, handing out weapons to its citizens to fight against Russia. Oh, if they'd only been prepared earlier. <laughs> That'd be a great... I'd like to live in a country where the government doesn't have to pay, that you're allowed to buy all, all, the, all the ones you want. Oh, I, I guess I do live in that so far. Be prepared. They've told us in World War II, Japan didn't want to attack our west coast because they were afraid of how many guns were here. All right, Nehemiah is telling them, let's get ready. 
Yes, they've surrounded us. Let's be ready for the attack. Let's be prepared. Get together with your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives. Get into, get into your houses. And it came to pass when our enemy heard that it was known to us. And God had brought their counsel to naught. Then we returned all of us to the wall, everyone to his work. Be prepared. Spiritually, be prepared. The devil as a roaring lion walketh about. Satan's seat in among you. Be prepared. Notice secondly, be equipped. Look at verse 16. And it came to pass from that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work and the other half held both spears and shields and bows and haberdians, haberdians, I'm not sure how, what that one is. I mean, how to pronounce it. I know what it is because I looked it up. And the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. He tells us in verse 16 that when he knew of this eminent attack, he divided the people that were working on the wall and he divided them and half of them would work while the other half stood watch. Then after a while, those that were at watch would go to the work, and those that were working would go on watch. What a great plan. Can we call that the first church security team? Maybe that's what that'll be. We've got one in the lobby and one watching the monitor back in my office, watching what's going on around here. Here they were. While some, while some were working, the others were watching. And those that were watching had four weapons, spears, Shields, they're ready for hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's why you have a shield. You're ready for close proximity. Spears, shields, bows, and then that other word, habergions. And I looked it up in a Webster's 1828 dictionary, and I'll tell you what it says, and you can try to visualize this. A coat of mail or armor to defend the neck and the chest is formed of little iron rings united and descending from the neck to the middle of the body. I think of, if you've ever seen this, what's that? There's uh, Indiana Jones and the Holy Grail, I think is what it is. And that guy that's guarding it's got that hood on and he's got that, that thing. I know, I'm sinful. I've watched that movie. He's got everything from here down to here. It's all covered in this, this uh, iron ring covering that he's wearing there. And I guess that's what this is. These men were prepared. And they were equipped. They had both spears and shields and bows. And they had this armor from the neck down to the chest. They're ready for somebody that's coming after them. They're prepared to defend themselves and defend the city. They are prepared and they are equipped. Half of them on the wall working and the other half. And that army standing outside that tried to intimidate them, when they saw that, they said, we better come back another day. We're not going to try to fight them right now. Because they were prepared. Not only that, look at verse 17. They which built it on the wall, and they which bear burdens, and those that laid it, every one with one of his hands wrought in the work, with the, and the other hand held a weapon. So even the half of all the people that were doing the work, whether they were the ones setting the beams or the stones on the, on the backs of the laborers, whether they were the ones lading, carrying the stones on their back, whether the, they were the workers that were on the wall, taking those and putting it, it says in one hand they worked, and with the other hand they had a, they had a sword. All right, the first group had spears and bows, and yet this group, the one that is working is still not unprotected. They've got a spear on their side, or a sword on their side. And with that they laid it, everyone with his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. For the builders, everyone had his sword, verse 18, girded by his side so that he built it. They were prepared. They were equipped. Notice the end of verse 18, and he that sounded the trumpet was by me. I like that. You can imagine this two and a half mile outside circumference of this city and they're all working and half of them are working and half are watching and the ones that are working are working with one hand and got a sword, uh, sword on their thigh in the other hand and they're all going at it and Nehemiah's got the trumpeter standing next to him because they're going to work and work and work and work until the trumpet sounds. 
When Nehemiah sees the enemy advancing, he'll tell the trumpeter, you sound that trumpet, then everybody drops everything and they go to fight for the city. They're going to work, I like this, they're going to work until the trumpet sounds. Does that sound like the church to you? That's what we've been called to do. Make sure you got your weapon. I like it. You know what they had? They worked with one hand and had their sword in the other. The word of, word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. Don't ever be without your sword. Have that sword handy all the time. Have it where you can reach it. Make sure you carry your sword. So here it was, they were with them and the trumpet. They had, they had been prepared. They had been equipped. And then thirdly and lastly, they were organized. A good soldier is prepared, he's equipped, and he's organized. The military trains and trains and trains and trains and trains. They train until they can do what they're doing in their sleep. Because they're going to have to do it when they're in the fog of war. They've got to know how to tear that weapon apart and put it back together. They've got to know when to move forward, when to come back. They've got, they've got to understand everything. And they've got to be trained. And here... Here Nehemiah says in verse 19, And I said to the nobles, to the rulers, to the rest of the people, The work is great and large. And we are separated one, uh, upon the wall one from another. In what place therefore ye hear the sound of the trumpet? Resort ye thither unto us, and our God shall fight for us. I like that. Nehemiah's faith and his hope, our God shall fight for us. So he's got, the, he's got, it, he's got it organized. Work where you're working. If you hear the trumpet, wherever that trumpet sounds, you come to that place immediately. And we will fight. And we will defend these walls. So we labored in the work. And half of them held the spears from rising of the morning till the stars appeared. Likewise, at the same time, said I unto the people, let every one with his servant lodge without Jerusalem, that in the night they may be a guard to us and a labor on the day. He's got them organized into groups. Those inside the city, those outside the city. Those working, those watching. And even those working with a, a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. Verse 23, so neither I nor my brethren nor my servants nor the men nor the guard which followed me, none of us, none of us put off our clothes, saving that everyone put them off, I'm thankful for this, for washing. Chapter 4 is all about opposition. Opposition that could have knocked them out and prevented the wall from being built. Opposition from without, opposition from within. But under Nehemiah's leadership, and that's going to be the topic of chapter 5, but under Nehemiah's leadership, they got that wall built in 52 days, in, the sp in spite of the opposition. Be ready, be prepared for the opposition. Be equipped, be organized. You know what this is tonight? This is military training. That's what we're doing here right now. We're training you with your sword. We're, we're giving you classroom teaching. I can't, I, I've still got my notebooks from boot camp, basic training. I've still got them. Everything I had to write down in those, we sat through classes after classes after, you think everything's out there shooting and throwing grenades and all. No, there was, there was a ton of classroom stuff. And that's what we're doing right here. We'll take it out there and throw the grenades, hand the gospel tracts, put out the flyers, invite people to church. But this is the classroom training. We need to be organized. Folks say, and I said this before, oh, I don't believe in organized religion. That's because you're not a soldier. You're not fighting on a team. You're, you're a little mercenary running around doing whatever it is you're doing all by yourself. You'll never change anything. Be a soldier. Let's stand together tonight. We're going to sing a song together.
Page number 418. Page number 418. A good question for us to ask ourselves in light of the message in the study tonight. Be one of Nehemiah's workers, working with one hand and the sword in the other until you hear the trumpet sound. Don't worry about the opposition. Page 418. Am I a soldier of the cross, a fowler of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own his cause, or blush to speak his name? Must I be carried to the skies on Nehemiah's faithful workers. Revival meeting Friday, Saturday night, all day Sunday. Looking forward to what the Lord has for us through Brother Griffiths. I have traveled over the, since the last time he's been with us, I have traveled north, south, east, and west, I guess. Anytime he's within an hour, an hour and a half, I drive and we go listen and hear him preach. So this time we get him right here at home. So we're looking forward to a great weekend together. Be part of it with us. All right, Brother Jeremy Allen, if you would, sir, dismiss us in prayer, please.